Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to Piano Tech Radio Hour. As always, we're being brought to you by Piano Technicians Master Classes, an online educational resource that offers you cutting-edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. Find out more at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. We just finished our first online convention. No, our second online convention yeah. ever. And we got a lot of great content. If you missed it, you can take a look at the recordings or one lecture at a time, whatever you like, or you can subscribe and you'll get one lecture a month added to your library. Today's guest here is Bernard Malberg. He is the owner of Malberg Piano Restoration. Quite a creative name. He, his goal has been to help his customers return cherished musical instruments to beautiful condition by preserving cultural treasures, he makes the world just a bit better, one piano at a time. And he's a soul brother of our soul brother, David Anderson. So David, <laughs> tell us a little about what you know about Bernard and his soul. Well, I'd, I'd known Bernard by reputation for decades as like the guy in Texas. The rebuilder, uh, or one of the two like giant rebuilding shops in Texas, and uh, heard he was kind of like a bohemian, great guy. <laughs> uh, did a lot of service with PTG, really beloved in the community, but I had never met him until like four years ago, when I went to teach at the. Uh, at the regional conference there, the SCRC. And, and uh, he sat in on a class and then we sat together in the lunchroom and just, man, it was a huge connection, big time connection. And he ended up coming up out to California and spending time with me at my house. And I ended up going back to Austin and did an all day program at the University of Texas and did some mentoring the day after. And we just, we just got really close. We really, uh, his work, his, his life as a craftsperson is amazing. His pianos are impeccable. Um, his shop is about the coolest shop I've ever been in. Uh, he built, designed it and built it. And it it's a classic, uh, like classic artisan's piano workshop. Um, super timeless, I would say. And um, he's just been around and been in the piano business for more than four decades. And he's got a lot of wisdom and clarity about all a lot of things. So I thought he would be an incredible, an incredible resource for Piano Tech Radio R. And here he is. Well, well thank you, thank David. You, David. That's, 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 uh, uh, that's, uh, that's an amazing, that's an amazing, amazing introduction. And I'll, we got, we I got echoes. Hold, 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 hold um, on, Bernard. One second here. We got, since, we got echoes, since, since you're coming through your phone, uh, Bernard, you don't have to unmute yourself on uh, on Zoom. Yeah. Okay. We gotcha. Is we this is you. this audio good? That's great. That's great. Perfect. Perfect. I got a little echo latency thing happening. You're good but, now. Uh, let's see. Sorry about that. You can okay, turn you your hear volume. me all right? Yeah, we can hear you all right. If you need uh, we to have turn no your echo. phone volume down, you can. Yeah, we um, don't. Okay. We don't if you want, them. you know what? All we right. Can do a little... Am I still coming through okay for for what you guys can hear? Yes, you're fine. Nope. All right. 
All right. So, uh, well, anyway, yeah, well, well, thank you. Thank you to Mr. Anderson for the kind words. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, getting to know David in these recent years has been uh, a real special event for me. Uh, he he came to my house for five days when we had a, uh, uh, some, some pri- two days of, of uh, tutoring and an all day at the UT uh, Austin School of Music. So uh, that was that I had conspired to find a way for him to come back to Texas. And so so uh, we kind of organized this little event. So that was that was big fun back in 2018. And so yep. but now two years later, we hadn't we hadn't seen each other. But uh, anyway, uh, anyway, dearly beloved, thank you for uh, joining us today. And uh, I don't know anything about pianos except for stuff about rebuilding them. I don't play the piano. I don't tune pianos which are, are pretty heretical things uh, in this world. Uh, I'd be a better rebuilder if I was a tuner. I'd be a better rebuilder if I was a tuner. But, you know, you can only be brilliant at a very tiny number of things. <laughs> only a few of them coincide with pianos. So, anyway, that's that's kind of background. Um, um, I, I'm here to answer questions. Uh, you know, I've I've got a lot of opinions about piano rebuilding, I mean, like, like hundreds, maybe thousands of opinions about piano rebuilding, and a certain number of them are probably even true. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to share those as time allows. And then, uh, of course, uh, you guys are uh, very free to, I guess, tap in a question, and I'll do my best to tell you what I think about it and, and what my background is. So, um uh, so, David, you got any more questions? You want me to ramble on and tell about my early life let me, and stuff like that? or uh, Let me check in real quick. Are you still getting a latency on the audio? Uh, well, no. Actually, it sounds pretty okay. good. Okay, okay good. good. Just want to make sure. We also have some photos that you sent us, too. So if we want to run through those at some point, we can. Yeah, you can do that anytime So because people are going to get tired of looking at me. So, yeah, I just, just uh, <laughs> you know, they can they can just show up to give people something to look at. So. Well, so that's if, you all good. Can, if you can give us two, three minutes about how you got to being an artisan, world-class piano rebuilder from Bernard Malberg, wherever you grew up in Texas. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, um, I'm a fifth generation Texan. Uh, uh, I, I didn't live in Texas until 1966. I had, uh, was, an, was an optics scientist and uh, we moved to, to south of Houston he took a job at NASA where he worked for 20 years. So I'm actually the son of a rocket scientist, if you will. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he designed camera systems that, that helped map the moon and went on the Apollo missions and all that. Um, but I grew up not really wanting to join the technical world. Um, I'm a child of, of the, the, the 60s and the 70s. Uh, uh, the Vietnam War was going on. I uh, became a conscientious objector. I, uh, and uh, turned into kind of a left-wing guy opposing that kind of thing. I decided that I, I was not going to be suitable for institutional employment. And after a couple of years going to college at UT Austin, I decided, uh, you know, I should find some uh, other useful things I could do. I became interested in playing the, the banjo and the fiddle and the guitar in sort of the old-time Appalachian Southern American style. Began interested uh, interest in uh, uh repairing string instruments, building some string instruments. Um, so um, when I was 21 years old, I took a job working for a South Austin pipe organ builder named Otto Hoffman. That was my first time to workshop all day. I learned to use all kinds of tools, how to sharpen things, um, how to use a workbench, you know, all kinds of grunt work. Uh, very, very formative for me. And uh, Otto was was uh, quite a, a notable character in the pipe organ world. And uh, and otherwise, um, so I. But I, I, after about three years, I went out on my own to uh, to. I built a small shop and was able to uh, uh, get a certain amount of work doing uh, string instrument repair. Uh, this this piano technician guy uh, got got hold of me and wondered if I could ever refinish a piano. And I said, Well, I don't see why not. So. Um, you know, I, I ended up refinishing and repairing some pianos that he sent over to my shop. Me not knowing much about pianos, but I did, did know a little bit about woodwork. Uh, ultimately, I uh, went into partnership with this guy named Bob Hunter, and he, he'd been in the field about 10 or 12 years, whereas I hadn't been in there at all. 
we ended up going into partnership, uh, rented a warehouse space in South Austin. Um, uh, basically, uh, hired employees, had fixed overhead, which was very, very frightening. But uh, so from 1980 through the end of 1983, um, after that point, um, I bought out his interest in the business. So I was a uh, sole proprietor uh, from uh, January 1984 forward. And so uh, that's been me, uh, sole proprietor. I was in I was in my South Austin shop until the end of 1999 at the turn of the century. Um, in those uh, years in Austin, uh, I, I really solidified what I did. I started having the opportunity to work on more and better pianos. Uh, in 1985, I was uh, entrusted with restoring uh, some pianos for the U- University of Texas School of Music uh, under the Charles Ball. And that was a wonderful connection for me because they had some really good pianos that were in really bad shape. And they had a whole bunch of Model Bs that just needed a whole bunch of work. And so I was making pin blocks and sometimes even uh, in my early days, putting in some soundboards with the help of Mr. Nick Gravagna. I was one of Gravagna's uh, uh, soundboard in the box customers. I think I maybe did 30 pianos using uh, wow. Nick's uh, soundboards. Um, so um, over those years, uh, I kind of got, got some connections and got a word of mouth reputation going, which is exactly what people need if you're going to do this kind of work. So I got anyway, a question and then, for you. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of really interesting stuff. And of course, you know, our people that are uh, observing here, you're free to add your questions as we as we run along here. You mentioned that you had a partner and that you bought out his side of the business. And I know that the piano business is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's not it's not one of those businesses where things get sold, sold and traded around a lot. So I don't know if you're willing to share. It seems like it was quite a, quite a while ago. Maybe there's something interesting in how you went about you know, creating that transaction and valuing his part of the business, you know, was that easy? Was it difficult? Do you feel like it ended up being fair? Uh, how, do you mind answering questions about that? If, if not? Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm happy to. So is, are you addressing like people entrusting me with the work or deciding that they should send me the work or, or I guess, uh, my question is, you said you had a biz, you had a partner that you were running the business. Oh, yeah. you, you sort of bought his share of the business. And so, Oh, you know, that's right. You, you came yeah. up with like a lump sum or like a payment, you know. Or a payment oh, yeah. No, I, or... I think I got a bank loan. I think I got a bank loan, you know, and uh, and eventually got that paid off. So was it a certain uh, multiple so. of the sort of revenue that you were making over the course of a year or how did you figure out that? No, income? it was just it was just a flat a flat fee in that case. Yeah. And, and he had to sign a non-compete agreement, too. So. <laughs> but the but the bank but gave you a loan for that too. It wasn't difficult. To, yeah, they the bank could say here's here's the business you against had against all odds. Against yeah. all odds. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, but yeah, I mean, the, in general, I mean, I, I would I say myself, and I think most people who do this work, it's really a word of mouth uh, way of developing your your known persona in a certain field. Uh, and, uh, of course I, I ended up working for quite a few piano technicians. I, people would refer one of their customers pianos to me and, uh, I've actually rebuilt the personal pianos of piano technicians in this area. And so, uh, I, I've, I've always felt that, uh, doing really good work for piano technicians, uh, or like in a university setting, uh, first of all, it's super demanding because they, they can, uh, they can know the difference between, uh, you know, good work and not so good work. And that keeps you to a high standard, but then also they spread that word around to their, their clients and their customers and people that they, uh, they, they bump into. So, so, uh, I mean, I don't think you could, you could advertise the heck out of uh, your business and what you do, but I think, uh, that, that slowly built, uh, word of mouth is, uh, uh, pretty much the gold standard. I'm sure that applies to people that do piano service as well. Yeah, that makes um, sense. So, uh, Mike, uh, so many questions, but first question is, how did you get, like, I talked to Charles Ball, and he said, yeah, from the first piano we got from him, from the very beginning, they sounded great and felt great. So how did you, how did you acquire that skill 
of making a piano sound great, but even more amazing, feel great. You know, how did you figure out how to yeah, make no. it feel good? Well, well the, you, the, you know, the you got an echo again, we, we, brother. Uh, oh, okay. It said, okay. That's, there you go. I just, I just, I, don't worry. That, that tells you to unmute. Don't do it. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, all right. Now I'm hearing now myself, I'm hearing myself twice. twice. Yeah. So you got to mute. Turn your computer audio down. We got, oh, just so everybody okay. knows, we, we, we retrieved Bernard from, you know, the middle of, of Wi-Fi dead zone out there in, in Texas where he is. <laughs> right. So we yeah. had him call in via phone so we could get it, get better audio. That's, that's what's going on. <coughs> well, so well, David, so David uh, um, I was, I was, I was mostly, mostly belly, belly 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 because, because on. you have to mute your computer, brother. Okay, your computer's muted now. I'm, I'm muted. I muted you on the computer. Okay, you should have the volume. Okay. Am I sounding better now? There you go. That's Keep good. Going, there you go. Am I good? Okay. Yeah. So, so no, I didn't do action work for the university. I, it was pretty much uh, belly work uh, because uh, that was what I did, and then they would restore the actions and, and such in house. But what they they didn't do pin block replacement, bridge work, um, sometimes soundboard replacement. Later on, soundboard replacement. Um, I did. I did end up installing new keyboards and a couple of pianos at UT before they had. You know, and the, let's see that I. I ended up getting those from Kluga at the time, and I didn't know anything about replacing the keyboard either. But I think Charles Ball wanted me to take all the risks and and do all the the dirty leg work. <laughs> so and before they started putting in new keyboards, but but. Um, no, it was more than the belly work. And once in a while, we would do an institutional finish or even fully refinish a piano for them. So that was that was my my beginning with it. And um, and you know Charles Charles Ball, uh, his he would if if there was something that I did on one of the pianos that he thought could have been done differently or or the next time you do one for us, please do this and don't do that. Um, that's hugely beneficial for somebody. I mean, I've been in a learning mode my whole life. I mean, I have I've not been learning, uh, but uh, but anyway, that was a great a great uh, opportunity for me to uh, to really start uh, uh, refining what I did. So, so you got questions you, in the chat you, here, by the way. When yeah, go. Ready. Go. So so first of all, Dave Dave actually asked, "Do you have pictures of the shop? Should we show some of these pictures you got?" And you can well, sure, go ahead. Them. All yeah, right, absolutely. Let me, bring, let me bring those up. Let's see here. Now you said some other things to look at besides your pretty face, but the first picture you gave me is your pretty face. So I'm not, not yeah, not well, that, clear on that. That's a, that's a few years ago. That's when I only had 64 years of experience as a as a, a human citizen of Earth and then U.S. and Texas. So <laughs> that's a nice hat. Yeah, but that's, that's me. A nice hat. Yeah, he wears yeah, nice lids. Nice lid. Is that uh, where? Where are you there? What's wh why? Are you I'm at the uh, Austin Traditional Music String Band Festival uh, out at Camp Ben McCullough. And uh, uh, back when I was a youngster, I was one of the co-founders of the Austin Friends of Traditional Music. So that's that's oh, how come cool. I'm there. <laughs> that's awesome. So this looks like it is in in your shop yeah. out there. And, uh, yeah. These are your, yeah. This these is are your this is us here? with a. Uh, yeah, well, they're they're my 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 cherished colleagues, you know. Um, <laughs> so so right there, it's it's a rib press, and and all of us just got done putting uh, ribs uh, on. It's a go bar deck that we use. We uh, we use the traditional hide glue to put the ribs on. And when Gravania quit doing his soundboard uh, service, he actually called me and asked if I wanted to buy his business. As I said, well, Nick, I have never made a soundboard. I've been buying the heck out of your soundboards for quite a few years, but that's a really kind offer, but I think I'd better pass. And I guess he, I don't know if they're doing it again, but at that point I realized I needed to make a rib press, which I did. And that's kind of, you see there. And so uh, that's me in the middle. Uh, the lady that's standing up is Celeste Coburn, who still works with me below uh, her on my left is Nathan Cook, who's a notable piano technician. The guy on my right is Jim Watson. And now has his own rebuilding shop, and I, I actually gave him my rib press uh, to use in his work. And then uh, the lady at the end is, is Lon Krotsky. Uh, she we rebuilt her grandmother's Model O Steinway, and Lon wondered if she couldn't uh, 
do some work on it herself. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll pay you low wages and we'll deduct that from the cost of restoring your grandmother's piano. And so, so that's, that's, that's where we all are. Wow. Cool. And that's, uh, uh, again, uh, on the far right is Jack Brissett Mills. Jack and I have worked together for over 20 years. He's a, he's an independent piano technician. He's done, uh, uh, but he does subcontract work with me. He's, he's my damper and, and, and final regulation guru. Uh, there's Celeste Coburn, uh, who, who is still with me after 13 years. And then Jane Howell, who, who's worked with me for about four years now. She only lives half a mile from the shop too, which is amazing. There we have, uh, we're just taking the, the soundboard out of a, looks like a model O, uh, uh, Jane in, uh, Celeste, and then uh, the, the resident dog, Maji. That's the back porch of the shop building. Oh, sorry. I got out of the pictures there. Let me get back to where we were. Ooh, that looks fun. You look like you're playing the banjo. Yeah, that's that's, that's in the wood room. That's me holding up a a double A, a, a Mason and Hamlin pin block. Unless it's a double B. Maybe it's a double B. I don't know. Anyway. Yep. Cool. That's me uh, holding forth. Uh, it's a group of uh, high school students. We rebuilt a couple of instruments for uh, Alamo Heights High School in San Antonio. And uh, the uh, choir master wondered if we, we couldn't have a field trip where the kids all come up and visit the shop while we were rebuilding the two pianos that uh, belong to them. And so that's me talking to the, to the kiddos from the high school. Nice. That's great. Another another rib press thing with uh, the guy on my right is Deniger. He's he's got a, a piano uh, retail business now in Dallas, and then you've already met Nathan Cook and and Celeste and the large dog who's getting picked up there. He only weighs a hundred pounds. So. <laughs> wow! I wish there was some shots of the the whole length of the studio. It's such a an elegant you know, main room. It's amazing. It's yeah. I don't know if I was sending there might be some, there's, Oh, well, here's, oh. here's the back porch stop. Um, this is from a, a 1990s model D that we were, we had to get played upside down. So as to make the pin block for it. And then I noticed all these little uh, places. And so I thought, well, of course we need some single malt whiskey there and a couple of glasses. So. That's a beautiful view. What's your, I mean, you are you, What's your elevation there? It looks like you're a little bit up on a mountain. We're, we're just under, we're just under seven yeah just under seventeen hundred feet above sea level, and so by comparison, city of Austin's like maybe four hundred five hundred feet. San Antonio's about the same, so uh, we're kind of on the the Edwards Plateau is what it's called, and then our place is actually on a it's on a mesa that is a, a watershed divide between the Pertinalis River, which joins the Colorado, and the and then the Blanco River, which eventually joins the Guadalupe, but they both to the uh, Gulf of Mexico in different paths. Very cool. Yeah. Wow. We do a lot of work, and this is a springtime view. You know, Texas it seems like such a beautiful place for about two or three months out of the year, and uh, of course that's when that's when they always try to get uh, people to buy houses and and put new businesses in place. But uh, yeah, uh, spring is, is, is about the best there is in Texas. And this back porch, we do a lot of stuff that makes fumes and dust and chips. We do that on the back porch uh, whenever the weather's nice. But yeah, that's, a, I think, a Model L upside down, getting a few things done. Pianos have to go upside down like this when you rebuild them. There's just no other way that I've found. So That's pretty heavenly. Oh. Yeah, restoring restoring the keyframe. There we are uh, thicknessing the soundboard panel. We, we, try, you, to, we you, try to pretty much. How do you do that uh, in the panel? What do you use? Well, protocol. Well, we we first of all, so we we get panels from um, uh, from uh, the Bulldogs, and uh, we get the thick ones. They the, the, the spinal ones are really thin compared to what we want. And so we get the Mason and Hamlin ones, and that gives us enough that we can uh, kind of shape them down to where they're more similar to what the original 
uh, thicknesses were. And, and whether there's a better thickness than what the old ones had, you know, I just don't really know. Um, but uh, all I've known to do is to, uh, all, all the, uh, you know, I, I just, I just try to duplicate what's there. I figure that, you know, if I can get close to what the original guys did, that's probably good enough. So I, I'm not really smart enough to redesign a piano. I'm, I know there are people who, who do, and, and I respect that, but uh, I'm just not one of those people. Nice and there's, glasses. there's me nice uh, goggles. routing, routing out uh, some wood. And then, then we hands, you know, you, you can machine and hand sand and all that to smooth it out. So, um, anyway, are those just little piles of, of, uh, sawdust that kind of coalesce because of, of well, no, or what's you know, going if you're, on there? well, you, you got to leave the, you, the, the router has to have something to reference the, uh, the height see and so so you have to leave these little things to support the router because otherwise it'll lurch in and make too deep of a cut and so you go you you, you just cut the majority of it out and then once you're there you can you can uh, machine sand those little little support stuff and uh anyway that's yeah oh so and that's if you know if you had a big a cnc machine would be the more elegant way to do that but i, I haven't ever had one of those so those are actually still the board that high in those on those little supports it's not piles of things well it's yeah actually yeah. The, i mean it the, looks it looks like it's more because i think that they cast the shadow but but yeah you know basically i mean their soundboards on these old pianos they're thicker in the middle underneath the bridges and then they get right. thinner out of the perimeter so they have more flexibility right. and they're a little bit thicker i guess just because the mass is gives it some strength and and helps work with the bridge and such but uh so yeah that's 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 what we're doing there though wow and um and this is uh, uh celeste and jane in the shop doing some detail workout we had a chance to restore a uh a, a play l a seven foot art case grand uh, uh from the 1910 which was a, a very interesting piano to, to restore and this is at this is in one end of the shop correct yeah, this is in the main the main room. You know, right. it's like about you know maybe forty five feet long and about twenty five feet wide. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of one one big room. Uh, uh, there's there's we got four skylights and we got on the south side we've got got good windows for natural light, and um, the shop is 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 basically like an adobe block construction. It's a compressed soil block, so the walls are a foot thick, and so they've got pretty good thermal mass to them. Um, I'm kind of a fan of thick walled construction. So anyway, um, well, um, are there, are there any, any questions that have come in that I, I, well, I should I was try to answer? Say, I had a couple right off the bat and I'm going to hog the questions for a minute here. Um, what do you know about play L? Um, do, did you learn? Well, about well, they were doing that. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know a whole lot about play else, except that I know they was pretty much considered the premier French made piano. I mean, I guess, <laughs> and they persisted into older years. Uh, I didn't, um, I, yeah, I, I didn't uh, have much, much knowledge about them, but uh, I was super impressed with this 1910 play. Of course, 1910 was a great year for pianos all over the world. Uh, but yeah, um, Play the play L that the the play L that we worked on was I've done it one other before this one, um, pretty idiosyncratic. But I mean I had I had a lot of respect uh, uh, for for the people that made it, especially after really going into it. This thing had had this amazing bunch of um, you know uh, marquetry and, and and veneer inlay. So um, they're obvious. Uh, oh, and it had its original French polish, which is basically shellac that is applied in this traditional method that we have barely learned a little bit about uh, in order to do some touch-up work on the, the case of that. But uh, yeah, just just the the workmanship from that era it pretty much blows me away. You know, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess that play one was, thing to keep. Uh, Playo was a design like a designer outside of pianos. Is it? I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you know that for no, sure. No, they, for sure. no, they, you know, it was an entire, you know, piano building company and factory. And I mean, I guess the, the, the Monsieur Gleel was, was there, and I haven't really, I don't have the, 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 you know, the history of it in my mind, but, 
But yeah, they, um, they and they built all manner of, of pianos. Uh, the, we've seen, I've seen here in Texas, we see more of the uprights around. Uh, there was a period of time when uh, when uh, the foolish Europeans would pack shipping containers full of old uh, British Isles and, and continental uh, upright and grand pianos and ship them off to antique dealers in Texas. And the and the, the and the shrewd and wise Texans would buy all these old pianos, thinking that they were immensely valuable which back home they were considered pretty much worthless. So um, we've, we've been awash in some of those pianos. <laughs> so uh, my other anyway. question was uh, on the back wall of that last picture, I saw what looked like some type of music library of CDs or tapes or, or something like that. Was that correct? Oh yeah, it, it is. Yeah. It is my, my old and obsolete CD collection. <laughs> tell me a favorite, yeah, tell me a favorite from the wall there. Oh man. I don't know. Probably one, one that we like to listen to if we're doing something really exotic, like 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 looping in a soundboard panel. I like to hear the Taraf de High Dukes, who are a uh, a, a, a a Transylvanian gypsy uh, band that plays traditional uh, uh, East European gypsy music. Taraf de High Dukes, look them up. Whoa, yeah, I'm gonna check that out. They're like, if if I was gonna run away from home and join a band, I think it'd be the Taraf de High Dukes. I'm look that but up. I never did. I was too busy being married and, and running a piano rebuilding shop. So uh, Dave Skolnick, mm-hmm. who's the one who asked to see the shop. So hopefully we got a little, little look peek into that. He also asked how did or do or both, how did or do you provide divide your operations when you're doing the work in the shop? Well, that would be kind of like the division of labor question. And, you know, there's certain things that, that, different people in the shop do and and you know like some of them are like like some of some of the folks who have worked with me and i'm talking about now but also throughout my my 40 plus year career you know people that are piano technicians piano tuners those those folks i would i would more naturally get them to do of course tuning of the pianos and and you know getting getting the uh, the finer regulation processes done uh, and, and then there's other things that I've been the only one in, who did, or when I was fortunate, I was able to train some people like some of the, of something like, like making new bridges. I mean, you know, in, installing a, a new bridge cap and, and doing a, a new bridge when you're making a new soundboard is probably the, the highest skill thing that, that I've ever done. And, and I'm, I'm just now realizing that I'm barely confident to do it. So <laughs> it's, it's um, so it's really, it's, it's, and I, the other thing, and I, I'm right now, I'm the only guy who knows how to spray any kind of finish in the shop. And it's fortunately our, our refinishing is, is at a much lower ebb, uh, but, uh, and, and, and dearly beloved, I, I do not recommend you to do your own refinishing and case restoration. If you are a piano rebuilder, it, in my case, that was one of the ways I started. I started learning about pianos from kind of from the outside going in because some of my earliest work was, uh, was doing uh, finish repair, uh, making stripping pianos, making new finishes, coloring pianos uh, for, for wood tone finishes, um, then, then uh, doing soundboard repairs, and then, then doing pin blocks once I learned what a pin block was and what it was supposed to do. And so, yeah, anyway, you, 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 really, I, th- I think most shops, most small shops like mine, I mean, I would say, over my time, I've had as many as six workers that were different amounts of full and part time. And right now I have, I have two people that are essentially part time and then a couple of other folks that come in and do things on a, on a subcontract basis that, that have some specialties. So, so uh, you, you have, hopefully there you've got enough people that can, can cover, cover the different areas of work. Yeah. So you've worked, basically you've been, forced or compelled or challenged to work with a team and lead a team since your very first days in the, in, in the craft, correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I do not, I do not see piano rebuilding as a one person job. Um, I mean, there are people that can do it and, and I've known some technicians that, I mean, come hell or high water, they were going to do every single thing themselves, but um you know, having a, the the aforementioned opinion that a person can only be brilliant at so much. I mean, I think you kind of have to choose your battles, and 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 if you do everything yourself, just because you enjoy knowing how to do it, 
well, that's all very cool. But also, if you're if you're hoping to make any money, uh, you know, you kind of have to put your own time where it's going to, you know, bring the re- best results. And then, right. of course, um, it, 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 it definitely pays you to, uh, you know, farm out people who who are specialists in doing certain aspects of the work, whether they're working for you or they're somebody that you could subcontract out to another source. And I do admire some of the technicians that, that have kind of co-ops. That we we like like Chris Brown. He talks about uh, you know people that that kind of have these different. Like you have a belly shop and the finishing shop and and the action shop. And and uh, I think that's that's a really intelligent model for uh, the piano rebuilding trades. So it's it's um, it's what basically cars do. Uh, you know, like custom high-end work on cars. It's all specialized. Yeah. Doctors, dentists, uh, you know, financial consultants. It just pays. Um, yeah. But what the question I wanted to get the question I wanted to get to was: You've had to lead a team for almost forty years. What are the what are the qualities of a leader and the qualities? of somebody who successfully leads a team that you believe? Well, yeah, man. Well, that's, that, that's a real big question. I would say in, in my case, I, uh, first of all, I, I would, uh, I have never told anybody that they could be an apprentice because I don't think in our culture, the traditional European or Asian model of apprenticeship really works. But basically what I have done is I would hire people who, first of all, people that would usually approach me because they were interested in doing some kind of work with their hands or they were interested in musical instruments or pianos. And I would I would hire people sometimes right off the street and um, pay them low wages uh, and and, you know, get them going. I, I would I would tell people that had the a wider interest of learning about pianos or, or becoming a piano technician that, you know, if, if they, if they do the work that, that needs done and if they stick with it and if they're curious and if they keep their eyes and ears open and ask questions, just, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to learn, to learn new, uh, new things for sure. So, uh, uh, and uh, this is a good time. I actually made a list of piano technicians who've worked in my shop over the years. You may, you may recognize some of the some of the names. Uh, uh, I'm just going to read them here real quick. Robin Pitts, Ricky Close, Mary Fishing wow. Smith, wow. Linda Martin, Nathan Cook, Jim Watson, wow. Jeff Ferris, Jack Rosette Mills, Celeste Coburn. Um, oh, and even David C. Brown, when he was a just took a job at UT, he worked for me for a little while. So, you know. Um, and I've got in, in my, my shop is also in this region has been one of the few that would actually take in somebody and give them a full or part-time job and just say, and just teach them how to do stuff, do basic tasks. And then once they do that and they can do it well, you teach them to do a few more basic tasks. And um, I tend, I try to treat people with respect. I try to be flexible. Uh, I've never really had copious benefits to offer people, you know, uh, but I, I I have been pretty flexible if they have other life things they need to date working working in the shop with me. So, um, yeah. That, say, anyway, that's when you say that uh, like the traditional models of apprenticeship that that might work in other countries don't necessarily work. Uh, what what do you think about it, or what is it about it that doesn't work in our culture? Um, you said in our culture. Yeah. You well, our culture. Of I'm, I I only have a. I only have a remote idea, of, you know, I think of the system in Germany, you know, and, and uh, there, there, there are, there are very formalized. I mean, there's actually, my understanding is there's real, you know, legal documents that give the role of the, the master and the apprentice, you know, but I don't know. I, it may, maybe the United States, uh, it, maybe, maybe we're, we're, we're just too egalitarian for that to really work out. But um but I mean, in essence, I have had people that work for me, and then they would later down say that they apprenticed with me. And so, it's, it's in a sense, it's it's that kind of relationship: low yes. wages, uh, hard hard work, and, and in exchange, you're actually learning stuff that you, that you can absorb those skills. And then, when you transcend working at, at a specific place, then then you you've got those skills that you can apply as the rest of your work life. 
And if you talked to the young man, what's his name that you're you're handing work to now? Oh, uh, yeah, Jim Watson. If you talked to Jim Watson, uh, I can't remember his name. I can never remember his name. I talked to him uh, at length uh, the day, the last time I was in Austin. He said you were, he said you were, the best boss and the best teacher ever. And I said, well, why? He said, because he's, he's patient and he has respect and compassion for human beings. And he's, he's well, I hope that's true. That's super skilled in what he does. Super skilled. Well, that's, that's an aspiration that I've had. And it's nice to hear that reported, but, and, um, you know, we do, but, well, it's always important to hear what people say behind your backs. You're behind your Well, yeah, it is. It's true enough. It's true enough. <laughs> the real truth. So, um, I, you know, I think people that are attracted to, um, well, first of all, you know, all of us in the piano service world, or whether we're tuner technicians or uh, have other connections, I mean, you know, getting musical instruments made to where they work well and give people pleasure and give people joy, there's there's really nothing wrong with that model. You know, it's not, you're not hurting anybody to help somebody realize their path in, in, in playing music, you know? So uh, that's one thing I've, I've, I've liked about it. That it, it is something that does little dollops of good in the world. And it does help people uh, who, who rely on their musical instruments for their, their own life path, you know, to, to do better and, and to uh, have more, more, uh, uh, more joy and, and satisfaction in, in playing the instruments that we help them with. So um, it's, it, it's, I have a lot of respect for all of my colleagues who, who are on that same path because it, uh, in, in, in you think of all the different ways that people find to earn a living, you know, you know if, if you have to, if you find yourself needing to support yourself and you're not just independently uh, uh, un, 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 un needful of work, um, yeah, finding a way to do that that is, is uh, doing a little bit of good in the world, doesn't do any harm. And uh, for me, I realized at an early age, I was completely unsuitable for uh, institutional employment. I mean, just enough personality flaws that just made me have to find something I could do independently, you know? I'm sure that and, and so I, a lot of us. I, I think quite a few of my, my, my colleagues in the piano world uh, probably share that same, that same affliction. <laughs> That they they don't have to they can they can find something to do uh, outside that's of that's why they a, say a big organization. That's also why they say getting getting uh, piano technicians aligned to do some things like herding cats as well. That's exactly very yeah, independent I'll folk. <laughs> very egalitarian, sure. very libertarian in a certain way. I'm, Mark, I'm like I'm like Bernard. Uh, Bernard, I, I'm I've never been a huge institutional piano tuner. Because I'm yeah. either intimidated or um, put off by, you know, uh, bureaucratic structure. Um, oh, yeah. And I'm sure it's, yeah, hurt me. it's hurt me in terms of my income, probably, or reliability at some point. But I just, I just have always felt better dealing in the private realm. I have venues and I've tuned for a lot yeah. of schools, but pretty much sure. on my terms, not, not, not like jugga to jugga to jugga to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, well uh, yeah, you're, you're another difficult case, David. And uh, I think well, most of us actually are. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can be proud of our little tribe of cats we got right here. That's, that's right. It's about as close as uh, you can get. So uh, right. do we have more Mark, questions, Mr. Jamie? Yeah, Mark Campbell sent me a private message. He said I should ask you about your your jigs. Uh, he said you're a bit of a oh, wizard. Yeah. Well, hello, hello, Mark. Yeah. Okay, well, well, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've been known to make a few jigs, you know, for the different things. That, uh, if I'm remembering right, um, Mark got in touch with me because, uh, oh, well, well, it comes to tapering hammers. You know, I, 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 I believe that we do need to control the mass of hammers. That's one of my little pet peeves. I do install hammers. You know, it's a, it's a piano technicianly thing to do, but mainly, uh, you know, there's a, you can use a table that you can use the table saw to cut the little 
side uh, of, of the thing. Now, now, Spurlock makes a cool jig that does this exact, or did make this thing as commercially available, a hammer tapering jig. But the one that I think is most useful and the one that I've made, uh, you can have a hammer with a shank already glued on. And so uh, when I install a new set of hammers, I get them untapered, unboard, extra long tails, no code cut. And um, so I, I, I calculate my bore and I glue them on. Then, uh, then from there, uh, I'll, I'll cut the tail. Uh, I'll, I'll cut, cut the, the tail to length if I'm doing it that way. And then the thing, and then I'll send it through my little tapering jig. And it, it's kind of a, you got, I, and we don't have time for me to tell you too much about it, except that it's hugely liberating to be able to uh, get a hammer uniformly tapered and, 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 because uh, it, it just, uh, there's so much weight in a hammer, and that ratio really makes a big difference in achieving a, a really nice fluid uh, touch on the piano. I've also dealt with some older Japanese pianos that had big old honking, untapered hammers, and they had this super heavy touch, and it was just because the hammers were gigantically huge, and, and so you could you could taper the sides and and you know get them reinstalled and voila you've you've done a world of good for the touch of the whole whole instrument so but yeah um, Spurlock's awesome. jig though is, is one I would recommend and and uh, if uh, if anybody really wants to I have some pictures if you want to uh, send me send me a message I can I can email you some pictures of it um, and I, I I guess I even I I maybe I should just give a, a either a, my phone number or an email address to any sure. of the folks that are watching in, in case uh, y'all should feel free to contact me. Um, sure. So uh, is it on your website? Say, Do you want me to just grab it from there and? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, chat? my my website has a landing page because I I haven't had a functioning rep website for quite a few years now. But yeah, yeah, my is this eight three zero number? Eight three three two two one zero. Yeah, one? yeah. There's that phone number, and you can also send me that. You can send me a, a an email through that landing page on my on my would be website. So one other <laughs> thing I was gonna just mention that that I I'm a big believer in is is really thorough communication with customers and. One of the things that I I do, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying that it, it isn't an indication of obsessive compulsive compulsive behavior, but I I do these amazingly intricate, like 12 page long piano evaluations and estimates where everything I'm going to do is itemized and the cost of materials and the cost of the labor. And I I've even gotten to where I put active links in my I always send people a PDF and have active links within throughout the whole estimate so. You could say, you know, in, install Renner hammers, and then a, a, a link to the to the Renner website. You know, uh, so. Uh, By the way, I've, when you put a, just no pressure to share it, but when you put a price on a part or something, right, in materials in yeah. a bit in a bid like that, do you end up putting your at cost price or some sort of marked up uh, price? You know, because I think different well, technicians I've, take I've, a different approach. I do that. mark it up. I do mark it up because if nothing else, there's shipping. And then a lot of times there's certain things you have to do to make, make the, the, the part that you buy work oh. well. And, you know, I, I think it's a legitimate thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, if somebody insisted on a different model, you know, I could, I could probably go there, but I don't feel that there's any dishonor in doing that at all. Uh, it's, in fact, you, you know, we, we need to, we need to mark up everything we do or we're not going to be in business because, you know, that's just how it is. That's how every business in the world runs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've, ha I've had client, a client here and there when they know they need a part and they know how much it is. And they say, well, tell me where I can order it. And then, you know, I'll go order it myself. And it's like, well, yeah. uh, <laughs> okay, but how else yeah. would you have found out how to order that? <laughs> you know? Well, that's right. Yes. <laughs> Do I get and do I get paid while I'm ordering it and 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 do I get paid while I'm doing the bookkeeping to pay for the thing and yeah I mean there's there's infrastructure overhead in everything we do. Well, yeah. Right? It what is it? It's not what does it cost you to? I, you know, at a certain point, I started figuring out. Okay, what does it cost to be David Anderson Pianos with a website, priceless, totally priceless, and this. The, well, no, 
there's a price. And I, at that <laughs> point, five years ago, I knew exactly what it was. And it was daunting, man. Daunting. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of uh, profit, you know, uh, yeah. excellence. We need it. Well, excellence eats profit. Excellence eats profit. The, the, the better you are and the more fastidious and dedicated to making an excellent product you are, the more money you spend, the more time you spend, the more you get into it. And the only way to recover that is to charge the most you can for all the work yeah. and the and the, no, it's, the products you sell. That's, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm totally with you. Uh, Absolutely. We've talked about that before too. I'll, I'll uh, thank you for, for adding that, uh, Bernard. Um, Pat uh, seems to be relatively close to you in, I think it was Fort Worth or something like that. Uh, would love to come and visit your shop. Yeah, so Pat, Pat said they're in Fort Worth, but also had a question if you've been to KFF. I'm not sure what KFF stands for. Maybe you would. Is that a Texas thing? Maybe, maybe um, I'm not. Th that's not ringing a bell with me. K, uh, okay. like like letter K and F F. F yeah, is in KFF. All right. Well, Pat, Pat, tell yeah. us in a little bit more detail what those uh, what that acronym stands for, and uh, and reach oh, out to Kerrville reach out Folk to Bernard. Festival. Kerrville is that what it Folk is? Festival. Oh. Oh. Oh no. I, no, I, I have actually never been to the Kerrville Folk Festival. I, I have quite a few friends who have gone there, and they're called Kerverts. Uh, this, this is a huge. It, it's it's uh, it's it's about another hour west of me, further into the hill country, and uh, it's 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 one of the uh, uh, things that has helped Texas, you know, keep and, and develop a, a big music scene. And, and of course, you probably have heard that Austin has a big music scene, and and it's true enough that over the last sixty or hundred years, that's that's very true. But uh, but yeah. But anyway, I I do I do uh, welcome visitors sometime you know by appointment so people can if if they're traveling this way and they're they have interest in piano stuff well we sure can do that I've uh, I, I usually over the over my time I I will just put in a plug for the Piano Technicians Guild uh, I've been a member of PTG for like 35 years or something they sent me a little pin a few years back for 30 years and um, but a lot of times I, I'll host one meeting a year in my shop. It'll have some kind of a technical focus, um, you know, and, and, uh, and so uh, since we're in the Austin and the San, uh, Austin and the uh, uh, San Antonio uh, chapters do a lot of things together, we're kind of geographically close enough. And so anyway, cool. uh, yeah, yeah. Y'all, 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 y'all hang out with PTG. It won't do you any harm. I would uh, have met Brother, I wouldn't have met you without PTG. Well, that's right. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a huge thing for all of us. Uh, and people, there's some people that can do it, do a, a have a perfectly good career without PTG. But uh, I, I just like I like the philosophy of PTG. You know, share what you know. There, I, I don't think I have any trade secrets at all. I mean, if, oh. if I if I come up with a new trade secret, I'll I'll get rid of it right away. I'll just say, here, here's what I do. Good luck, sucker. <laughs> that's right. I had it. You know, I heard something great from Del Fandrick, what he said about when he, he loves to share things. And what he, what he said, oops, sorry, I turned on this stupid radio next to me. Um, he said is, uh, he, he likes to share, he just shares what he's figured out. Like he's always working on something yeah. like real cutting edge and he doesn't really know exactly what it is yet. So he's got something that's kind of cutting edge and then he's got some stuff yeah. that he's already figured out. So, I mean, if as even if he's sharing the stuff that he feels most comfortable with and, and it's really cool stuff yeah. that he's got down pretty solid, there's always going to be more stuff on the horizon that, that he's working on. I thought that was a really interesting way um, just to look at it and, and for people to feel a bit more safe about, about, about sharing whatever, whatever they got down. Well, that's right. Um, we are just about two minutes out from our, from our closing time. I'm trying to see if any of the, if I can just squeeze in like one more, question comment or something like that i don't know it's certainly not probably a 60 second answer but i'll go back to this question about how do you determine the thickness of the board as you're routing that um well basics um, to share yeah 
Well, you know, um, I try to measure the approximate thickness. I use thousands of inch measurements, and I, I made it this sort of deep engagement wooden caliper thing with a dial indicator on the end, so you can get in there and, and you can kind of get some general measurements. And then you also could even just slice up the old soundboard and, and measure it that way. But it's kind of fun to draw a little topo map on there. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's basically it. Uh, just try to get those measurements, uh, and and then um, allowing that every every board probably a little different since they were largely hand. Some some guy with a plane was there planing away, and they maybe had little thickness gauges in the factory. I, I'd of course love to see that uh, back a hundred years ago to see how these things were done. But I have the idea that you could probably measure, you know, a hundred uh, Steinway A soundboards and get big variations but you'll get the theme you'll get you'll get the concept you know what what were the, what, what was the general goal that they had in getting the thickness made and so um as i say since i, I don't consider myself i'm not a designer uh, i'm not that much of a physicist i mean i played one on tv but you know that doesn't count right so uh so i just i just uh Try to try to do the best I can to to duplicate what we find in these old pianos and uh, and uh, but hats off to people that can redesign them and make them twice as good as they were you know but that's that's just not been my deal. Speaking of playing oh. uh, playing one on TV, we just learned uh, before we let everyone on the call that David Anderson actually got paid quite a pretty penny to 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 bark like a dog on a on a commercial at one time. Maybe we'll hear it. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> When I first came to Los Angeles, I did. And I, I yeah, sounded sorry. exactly like a dog. That's why they paid me <laughs> and didn't like poke a dog in the ass because I could, bar <laughs> I would bark on command. You know, I could, yeah. I could bark for 20 minutes. It's you, but that's only you when you're highly paid. Yes. <laughs> you got to trust your body on that. You know what I mean? It's like you, you can't do. think about mm -hmm. it. It's just, <laughs> it's right. just, just got to bark. <laughs> all right well thank you bernard very much for showing up today we appreciate you you uh calling in and uh heard a lot of wonderful stuff uh hope that people make a connection with you if people want to grab the chat um there's that dot 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 mark in in the lower right hand corner you can click on that and hit the save file all right uh, to, to grab his email address and phone number yeah. and things like that but you can also just look him up online and 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 reach out uh, to Bernard. So we really appreciate you joining with us and we hope that you keep in touch and we know you're kind of retiring, winding down soon. We hope all that all goes well. And uh, any last words from, from you, Bernard? Well, well, I say thank you to Ethan. Uh, you know, I, I think you, it, it's very uh, surreptitious that you got this remote way that piano technicians can keep in touch and, and share information uh, while we've been largely bottled up this last year. And, and of course, you, you can't do better than uh, the estimable David Anderson as your as your co-host on these things. So uh, uh, appreciate what you guys are doing and uh, make you uh, uh, success in your future endeavors. So uh, and, and thank you all for taking the time to listen to us ramble today. Yep. Excellent. Thank you, and Bernard. Thank you so much. Um, all of your colleagues in Texas love you. And there's a reason for that. It's because you're one of the wisest, clearest, most loving human beings. And that's it. That's what, that's what, why I love this community because there's a lot of people like that in our little piano nerd, piano tech communities. So <laughs> I'm grateful yeah. that, that you spent the time with us, brother. Awesome. Well, th thank thank you for all your support and all your kind words, and uh, thanks thanks to the folks who uh, came to join us today. Y'all y'all uh, live and prosper, okay? We'll do. got it, brother. And with that, we'll say okay. a nice arf arf. arf. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it anymore. My voice doesn't really bark authentically anymore. So I wish I did. I wish I could do that for you. All right, everybody, catch you later. Bye, kids. Okay. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time.
That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week. 